Coming up, we will summarize for you what transpired today when Finance Minister Ken Oforiata appeared before the Parliamentary Committee probing the censure motion for his removal from office. He responded to five of the allegations made against him after the committee set aside two of them. In effect, he denied any wrongdoing that warrants his removal from office and questioned the weight behind the allegations to warrant a censure. We take you to Qatar, where alcohol will not be sold at the World Cup's eight stadiums after FIFA changed its policy two days before the start of the tournament, and Tutak declares an indefinite strike. Welcome to Graphic Online's News in Brief. We start from Parliament, where the Finance Minister, Ken Oforiata, today appeared before the ad hoc committee probing the censure motion for his removal from office. He started his responses by first apologizing to Ghanaians for the hardships that the country is facing and acknowledged the economy is facing difficulties and people are enduring hardships. Today, I acknowledge our economy is facing difficulties and the people of Ghana are enduring hardships. As a person President Akufuado has put in charge of this economy, I feel the pain personally, professionally, and in my soul. I see and feel the terrible impact of rising prices of goods and services on the lives and livelihoods of ordinary Ghanaians. I feel the stress of running a business, but it is the strength and perseverance of the Ghanaian people that inspire me and my colleagues in government every morning. Co-chairs, let me use this opportunity to say to the Ghanaian people what I believe with courage every finance minister around the world may wish to say to their people now. I am truly sorry. Before his responses today, the committee explained to him why two of the grounds have been set aside, leaving five of them which he was to respond to. The committee has considered the uh, objection raised by your counsel, and we will uh, provide a, wit a written report, I mean a written ruling, which will be contained in our report. But we think that in light of those objections, you should not be called upon to answer questions relating to matters, I mean, of conflict of interest, uh, as uh, stated in ground one. Ground number three, relating to illegal payments of all revenues into offshore accounts in flagrant violation of Article 176 of the 1992 Constitution. When the evidence was adduced, there was a specific um, piece of evidence uh, relating to the payment of 100 million US dollars into an offshore account. account. And so on account of the evidence adduced, uh, which kind of contradicted the evidence that was laid uh, by the proponents of the bill, I mean by the proponents of the motion, uh, the committee has taken the view that you will not be called upon to deal with this uh, matter. Of course, members may have some ancillary issues arising out of the evidence of GMPC that they may be interested in, but I'll leave it to members to deal with. So in essence, uh, uh, my, uh, my co-chair, there are now five grounds that you have to deal with, Honorable Minister. On the other grounds, these were the responses from Mr. Oforiata, who went ahead to question the weight behind the allegations to warrant a censure. Um, Co-chairs, it's a very difficult uh, process. According to my understanding of parliamentary history, this might be the first censure of a minister. So it must be very grave issues that we are having to address. It's therefore unfortunate that um, in the co-chair's summation of the two grounds that have been struck out, it sounds to me like there was not a thorough review of the grounds as should have been. But to bring somebody for censure would require that these things are done of absolute thoroughness. But I'm pleased with the decision that have been made. 
Today's hearing also witnessed some exchanges between the chair and some of the members of the committee, especially between the co-chair, Mr. K.T. Hammond, who is the MPP MP for Adansi Asukwa, and Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, NDC MP for North Town. Don, I invoke Order 197. Which says what? The deliberations of a committee shall be confined to the matter referred to it by the House, and any extension or limitations to it made by the House, and in the case of a committee on a bill, to the bill referred to it and relevant amendments. It is my contention that, respectfully, we are being sent on a wild goose chase on matters that are not what, before what, what us. What am I um, asking you to do on that chase? What, what am I asking you to do on that chase? I'm making a comment. Co-chair, I think that, you know, well, because there's, wait, wait, there's wait, precious wait, time. Wait a minute. There, wait there a minute. so many questions. Wait a minute. Yes, you have your time to ask your questions. Yeah, Nobody's right. going to hurry but anybody this, up. I don't see the relevance with uh, you this may not see, news and all that. You may that. not see the relevance. Violation I'm bringing it up to the whole nation to be aware that our issues have been the concern of other countries and they made sure that it's become a matter of public discussion. I mean, mandate and I'm, not, I'm not from asking him Mr. to Speaker. comment. And from Parliament, we take you to Qatar, where alcohol will not be sold to fans at the World Cup's eight stadiums in Qatar after FIFA changed its policy two days before the start of the tournament. Alcohol was initially set to be served in select areas within the stadiums, despite the state being strictly controlled in the Muslim country. Those in corporate areas of the stadiums at the tournament will, however, still be able to purchase alcohol. The World Cup starts on Sunday when Qatar play Ecuador. Budweiser, a major sponsor of FIFA, is owned by beer maker AB Inverb and had exclusive rights to sell beer at the World Cup. Following discussions between host country authorities and FIFA, a decision has been made to focus the sale of alcoholic beverages on the FIFA Fan Festival, other fan destinations and licensed venues, removing sales points of beer from Qatar's FIFA World Cup 2022 stadium perimeters said a statement from World Football's governing body. There is no impact to the sale of Bad Zero, which will remain available at all Qatar's World Cup stadiums. Host country authorities and FIFA will continue to ensure that the stadiums and surrounding areas provide an enjoyable, respectful and pleasant experience for all. The tournament organizers appreciate AB InBev's understanding and continued support to our joint commitment to cater for everyone during the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022. Budweiser posted a message on Twitter and on Friday saying, Well, this is awkward, before the post was later deleted. An AB InBev spokesperson said they could not proceed with some of the planned stadium activations because of the circumstances beyond our control. The Football Sports Association criticized the timing of the decision to ban the sale of beer for most fans. Some fans like a beer at a game and some don't. But the real issue is the last minute U-turn, which speaks to a wider problem. The total lack of communication and clarity from the organizing committee towards supporters said an FSSA statement. If they can change their minds on this at a moment's notice, with no explanation, supporters will have understandable concerns about whether they will fulfill other promises relating to accommodation, transport or cultural issues. And back in Ghana, the Technical University Teachers Association, that is TUTAG, has declared an indefinite strike with immediate effect. This is following what they say was the government's failure to address a litany of demands including new rates for fuel allowance to reflect the current economic conditions. TUTAG, in a press statement issued today, said it has observed with grave concern the government's blatant disregard for the rulings of the National Labor Commission and the reluctance of the NLC to enforce its own ruling against the government. TUTAC said its codified conditions of service for members has been outstanding since 2016. The strike comes after a 10-day ultimatum to the government to honor all outstanding commitments. And before we go, in case there is a natural disaster or any other form of disaster, do you know what to do? Well, stakeholders as a social protection shock response system have some answers for you and how they themselves intend to work together and collaborate to absorb shocks. The data tells us that 45,000 Ghanaians are affected by floods every year. And then we have 
the coastline, which is 550 kilometers, half of it also being vulnerable to erosion and flooding. The goal was for us to be able to get um, ideas, consult with the key stakeholders who can help us in building a national social protection strategy. We're doing this in support of the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection together with UNICEF. It's not that we don't have the answers, it's that the people who should be doing the work don't necessarily engage. And I think we heard from NADMO today saying that when they get the most calls, it's during the shock. But it's important that people collaborate before and we're more proactive so that we can see concrete solutions. The problem as some of the um, um, service providers and office holders were saying was that very often we allow our social systems to interfere with um, policy implementation. Like they were describing the issue of building on um, protected spaces along the buffers of rivers and so on. Um, when people are not supposed to build there, but by the time the authorities wake up, it, the building has gone up. If you try to demolish it, it brings up all kinds of protests, and then the problem arrives. Thank you for watching. For more news, please visit our website graphic.com.gh or follow us on Facebook at Daily Graphic and on YouTube and Twitter at GraphicGH. I am Enoch Dafa Frimpong. Subscribe now.